Miller. I'm the uh, the marketing director for Pantonium, and I'm joined today by Chris Childs, who's uh, one of our operations and client support analysts. And uh, today uh, is going to be a very interesting topic. We're going to be discussing how to use on-demand transit data uh, to develop uh, and design and deploy better fixed routes. Uh, so it's really um, it's kind of the opposite of what a lot of people expect fixed routes and on-demand uh, services uh, to be. Um, and really, uh, he's going to bring uh, be bringing a few um, examples uh, of how some Pantonium clients have used our technology, uh, that, using it for on-demand services. Uh, but then, if I can, may use a, a slight joke, uh, use that data to build back better fixed routes. Um, so with that, I'll hand it off to Chris. Uh, so he'll walk you through uh, just a little bit of an overview and then go into some example use cases of how this we've generated this data and then used it to develop better fixed routes. So with that, uh, thank you, Chris. Thanks, Luke. Um, yeah, so welcome everyone. Uh, like Luke said, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm a member of the operations and client support team here at Pantonium. Um, so our team is really responsible for uh, making sure that our customers succeed when using our platform. And we do that in a few different ways. So leading up to a launch of uh, a new customer deployment, we're the ones who handle kind of discovery and uh, training on how to use our platform. Uh, we guide our customers through the launch and uh, kind of handle any ongoing support uh, requests and uh, assistance that they might need to make sure that everything continues to run smoothly after that launch. And uh, finally, our main kind of uh, our third main responsibility here is that we uh, monitor and analyze uh, riders' usage of ODT uh, on our customers' platform, uh, basically just to understand how riders are using ODT. Uh, and how they're using transit and how we can use all that information to deliver a service that's uh, better optimized for the usage that we see. So like Luke said, we're gonna be talking today just a bit about uh, what that data looks like uh, and how we use it to, in some cases, uh, build better fixed routes for our customers. Uh, so a little bit of preamble before we get into the meat of things here, but um, there's three kind of questions that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, how do we collect on-demand transit data? How do we analyze it? And how do we use it to build those better fixed routes? And uh, this will be, uh, so just to get into kind of answering those questions, a couple of uh, preemptory ones here uh, that I'll just go through really quickly. What is ODT? What is on-demand transit? And how does it differ from fixed route service? And this will be pretty familiar to anyone who's been to one of these webinars before, or if you're familiar with our company, but uh, I'll just go through it pretty quickly here. So uh, what is ODT and what is on-demand transit? Um, it's a kind of demand response uh, transit uh, where on our platform, riders are able to access a map of a service area and uh, request a trip between any of the transit stops that have been made available by the customer in question, um, by the, uh, the transit agency that we're working with in question. Uh, and the kind of key difference uh, between uh, ODT and uh, with fixed route service is that there's no routes from any stop in a service area, you can access any other stop. And so uh, we collect some information from our riders about uh, where and when they wanna travel. Uh, and that information is fed into our route optimization uh, algorithm, it's called the planner, which then uh, kind of builds optimized routes, optimized pathways between all of those different trips and uh, figures out which vehicles in the service area are best uh, equipped to handle those trips on an ongoing basis. And as we get more and more trips over the course of the day, uh, the planner continually readjusts its uh, best plan for how to handle those requests uh, as optimally as possible. So that's just kind of the gist of what ODT is. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit different from a fixed route transit service. Um, the main difference, like I said, is that uh, in on-demand, uh, riders aren't restricted to routes. Uh, instead, they've got an entire service area to play with, and uh, they can essentially just tell us, uh, tell the, uh, the transit agency that they're working with uh, where they want to travel and when they want to go. And they can do that uh, transfer free. So uh, in ODT, vehicles don't follow consistent paths between stops, but instead they visit stops as they're requested by riders. And um, there's no set travel patterns for the vehicles in question. Uh, a vehicle can go uh, between some stops on one day and then a completely different set uh, on the next day, just depending again on where riders want to go uh, in the moment. So what we're doing with uh, on-demand transit is that 
uh, we're kind of building the uh, the plan for where transit service is from the bottom up rather than top down. Uh, instead of kind of uh, dictating to riders where they can go to catch transit service to get on board a bus and uh, which uh, stops are available from where they're boarding, uh, we're just bringing the service to them. And so if someone wants to go all the way across town, then we can accommodate that. If they just want to go down the road, we can accommodate that too. Um, so what this kind of means for ODT is that in a way that uh, fixed route service isn't, on-demand is data-driven just from the ground up. Um, when a vehicle is uh, on our platform, when we're working with one of our customers uh, and uh, their vehicles are hooked up to our ODT system, uh, the vehicle is entirely directed by the rider requests that we're seeing. So as we're going on through kind of a day of service, uh, we're relying on rider inputs to uh, govern essentially where service is going to be uh, over the course of the day, uh, where the vehicles are going to go and where they're going to pick people up and drop them off. It's entirely driven by that demand. And uh, so as uh, the vehicles kind of move around according to where the riders want to go, the entire transit system kind of uh, reflects that too. Um, the entire uh, process of delivering service in an on-demand uh, platform is just completely governed by the rider requests. So from the, uh, the ground up, we're kind of relying on the information that uh, riders are providing to us to know where they want to go, where they want to have access to using transit. Um, so this is kind of a key difference uh, compared to fixed routes, uh, which isn't to say that fixed routes aren't data-driven. Obviously, you're not going to put a bus route uh, somewhere that no one ever wants to travel. Um, but in a fixed route context, a lot of the time you're kind of limited by an initial data set that may have been gathered uh, months or years before uh, the service actually goes into operation. Or if it's been running for a while, uh, maybe the ridership information that kind of uh, went into deciding where that bus route should go has changed in the meantime. Uh, obviously, a lot of things can change that uh, dictate you know, how people want to use transit. We're living in some interesting times in uh, that respect. Um, but there's all sorts of factors that can go into kind of changes in demand. And in a fixed route uh, setting, it's really uh, kind of uh, costly and uh, time prohibitive a lot of the time to actually be able to keep on top of those changes. Whereas uh, with ODT, what we kind of have is all of the data that governs where uh, our vehicles go is uh, drawn directly from riders. So we know precisely on a given day of service where people want to go. And uh, as time goes on, what we do is we kind of collect that information and we hold on to it. And that tells us where the ridership is. Um, and this is kind of the important thing too, is that that can change over time. But as it does, we have clear visibility into that. We're not really taken by surprise um, by uh, gradual changes uh, in the way that uh, fixed routes can be. So what this means uh, is that uh, when we first launch into a service area, uh, often we are talking to a transit agency with the kind of idea of uh, improving service in a particular area. Uh, usually how we start off with is with the service area, uh, that uh, involves one or more uh, bus routes or transit routes in general that are underperforming for whatever reason. So these are routes that, uh, for whatever the case may be, they're not really uh, justifying their own existence in terms of um, the cost to operate them. There aren't enough riders using them to really uh, justify having a fixed route there. Um, and so sometimes this is a case of physical placement, or sometimes it can be uh, down to uh, the time of day that that route is operating. Maybe there's uh, a lot of riders who want to travel along a bus route earlier on in the day, but then you get into the afternoon after rush hour and that demand kind of dies off and the route is underperforming at that point uh, just over the course of the day. Um, whatever the case may be, uh, you end up with a situation where you've got some routes that are just underperforming. They're not really worth the cost of operating them uh, anymore. And so that's kind of usually where we enter the picture. Uh, we take a look at these routes. Uh, we work with the agencies to understand uh, which routes, which areas uh, are currently underperforming, and we implement ODT in that area. Uh, we kind of open things up. We get rid of the routes. We say to the riders, OK, tell us where you want to go. Uh, and they do that, and we provide ODT service in that way. And a lot of the time, the story kind of ends there. Uh, sometimes you'll have an area or a time of day where ODT is a really great fit for it. Uh, if you have very kind of distributed demand uh, over uh, time or over the area itself, uh, then that can be a great fit for a long, uh, a very long-lived ODT service that does the job that it's being asked to do, and it does it well. Um, 
so this is kind of a win-win in this case. Uh, obviously, uh, riders get access to convenient transit, and the transit agency themselves get to cost co get to cut costs by replacing their fixed routes with ODT, which usually ends up being much much cheaper. Um, but in some cases, what happens is that we implement ODT and we start seeing that there are actually patterns in demand. Uh, ODT is really good at kind of handling uh, areas and times of day where there aren't strong patterns of demand, where you have riders who want to go all over the place, or you have a rider uh, who wants, you have a handful of riders who want to go from one side of a service area to the other uh, without any real kind of um, consistent patterns in the when or the where of those trips. But uh, a lot of the time, what will happen is that we'll launch into a service area and we'll start to see patterns emerge. And uh, so what we're kind of finding out when we launch ODT into an area is that it's not that there isn't ridership demand. It's just that uh, the fixed routes that were there that were previously underperforming might not necessarily have been placed well to fit that demand, uh, which becomes kind of a, a feedback loop. It's a kind of a chicken and egg uh, question where uh, there's ridership demand, but the fixed routes there aren't well placed uh, to meet it. And then, you know, riders don't use those routes, they become underperforming. Uh, the agency might reduce service along those routes uh, accordingly, and then the riders that were using them uh, are underserved as a result. So it kind of uh, gets worse and worse over time, and you end up with a situation where we end up entering the picture at that point. So once we do get in there and we uh, launch our ODT, we can find those patterns. and um, the cool thing about ODT is that a lot of the time uh, we have access to data that is kind of hidden to fixed route services. And we'll talk a little bit about how we get access to that data in just a minute here. Um, but uh, the key takeaway here is that uh, if we do end up in a case where it looks like, hey, a fixed route could go here, we can work with the agency to implement that fixed route, figure out exactly where it should go and uh, how we can best fit the ridership demand in a particular area. So uh, first question, now that we've gone through all that preamble, how do we collect ODT data? And I've already mentioned this, we get rid of the route and we let riders tell us exactly where they wanna go. So instead of continuing to dictate to riders, this is where service is available, we say, well, where do you want service to be available? Where do you wanna go and when? Um, and so, uh, like I said, this usually uh, means that in a service area, we'll get rid of all of the fixed routes and we'll just make uh, every stop in there available to every other stop, though it can kind of vary on exactly the scope and um, how, uh, how broadly uh, we go with this, depending on the customer in question and kind of the nature of the service area that we're working with. So how do we collect that information? Um, basically just by letting riders request trips. So uh, there's a few different ways uh, for riders to interact with the system, but they all have a couple of things uh, in common, uh, which is just a couple of details that we need in order to uh, arrange a trip for them. And when I say a couple of details, I, I really do mean just a couple of details. We need a pickup point, a drop-off point, and a requested time. And that's really all we need from a rider in order to uh, arrange a trip for them. Um, all we ever know about a rider is their email address, and then that's only if they want to use our apps, our self-serve options, uh, to create an account. Um, we never know anything beyond that. We never know where the rider themselves are. We're not collecting GPS uh, data from apps or anything like that. All we know about the rider is what they're telling us, essentially. And uh, riders do always have the option to travel completely anonymous, anonymously if they just want to uh, work with the transit agency in question and ask a uh, dispatcher staff member to uh, book a trip for them. So in terms of the data, uh, the data that we're actually collecting from riders about them, it's very, very limited. But uh, even still, we can use that data to come to a lot of different conclusions. Uh, and uh, no matter how a rider requests a trip, all of that information kind of goes into our system and we feed it into the planner, uh, which uh, does all of the hard work of optimizing uh, when and where uh, vehicles go to handle those trips. So over the course of the day, uh, this is what happens. We take in trip requests. The planner optimizes routes between uh, different stops to handle different trips. And uh, riders get picked up and dropped off exactly where they want to go, when they want to go. But the cool thing about this is that uh, we're not kind of throwing that data out at the end of the day. Uh, instead, we are holding on to it. We're storing all the information that we collect uh, from uh, riders about where they want to go and when. And we're keeping that in our databases. And uh, we're kind of building up a, uh, a rich data set of uh, trip requests. 
And uh, so this map is uh, generated actually from GPS information taken from uh, the vehicles uh, that were operating in Chatham-Kent, uh, one of our deployments. Uh, and this kind of just illustrates how uh, vehicles move around the service area uh, as they're responding to rider requests. This isn't actually usually a, a bit of information that we use when we're analyzing demand, but it kind of shows uh, the breadth of information that we do collect uh, without knowing anything specifically about the riders themselves. Um, but uh, just here, you can see all of these hot areas on this map. These are places where vehicles spend more time uh, over the course of the period that we were looking at here. Um, but uh, I mean, here we can see that we're already starting to uh, have some patterns crop up of where vehicles are spending more time, right in the center of town there. That's a popular place to be. Uh, we see these kinds of trends uh, show up in other areas of the data as well, specifically in the trip requests that we're getting from the riders. And uh, as time goes on, as we build up more and more data, uh, those patterns can become stronger and stronger. And uh, what that means is that uh, we are learning more and more about how the ridership in a particular area wants to actually use transit. And the really kind of important key piece of this is that because we've removed all of the restrictions about how people can use transit, uh, we know that the ridership patterns that we see are actually indicative of, well, how they want to use transit. Uh, they're not having to kind of jump through hoops to make these trips happen. They're not having to transfer between three different bus lines to get to work in the morning. They just say, hey, I'm at my house, I'm near stop A, I want to go to my work at stop B. Uh, they request that trip, we come, we pick them up, we drop them off. Uh, that's exactly kind of what they want out of transit. And that's exactly what we see in the system as well. So uh, we end up with a bunch of data. And the next question is, how do we analyze this data? Uh, so I mentioned anything that goes into the system, we can get out it again, it's all reportable, we can access all of that information. Uh, we don't know a ton about the riders themselves, but we know about how uh, they're using the system, uh, how they're making transit work for them. So we have a bit of information about uh, stuff like how riders are entering trips into the system, uh, if they're using the apps, if they're talking to dispatchers, if they're just flagging down vehicles and boarding uh, as walk-ons, uh, whatever the case may be. We can see how far ahead of time people are booking their trips. Uh, we can see how long riders are waiting to be picked up and how long they're on board the vehicle after being picked up, uh, which are actually some pretty important uh, bits of information when we uh, circle back and kind of look at uh, how well the service is doing in accommodating the ridership that we see. Uh, and it's uh, data that's traditionally quite hard to access in a fixed route context as well. Um, but uh, we've got all of that in addition to the details about uh, kind of how people are moving around the service area, how they want to uh, travel, uh, which stops they want to use, and uh, when, both over the course of the day and over the course of the week or month or whatever kind of time period we're looking at. So uh, when we uh, have all of this data in hand, we just kind of uh, start manipulating it. We slice it in different ways. We kind of uh, look for correlations between different attributes of the trips, and we look for patterns. And uh, one of the first ones that usually falls out when we start analyzing data is uh, information about OD pairs. So an OD pair is an origin destination pair. It's uh, the combination of uh, the stop or the location where a person gets on board a vehicle and the stop or location where they get off of the vehicle. It's just kind of the, uh, the two uh, start and end points uh, for their trip. So when we look through our data, we look at how many times a particular OD pair, uh, a particular pair of stops has been requested as a, uh, as it has been requested to be used for a trip. And uh, the more times that a particular OD pair has been used, uh, the more popular that specific trip is. But uh, one thing that kind of comes out of this pretty quickly is the fact that if you have, for example, 100 stops uh, in a service area and they're all accessible from each other, uh, you have just a ton of uh, permutations of different possible trips that people can use transit to uh, accomplish in that case. And so uh, when we start looking at just pure OD pairs, we end up with something that looks a little bit like this, that's a bit kind of overwhelming and a little hard to make sense of uh, at first glance. So this map is a map of uh, OD pairs in Fort Erie Transit. Uh, Fort Erie is one of our newer customers, um, and this map represents about six weeks of trip requests. Uh, so again, uh, what we did with uh, Fort Erie, we uh, looked at the service area, which is a uh, quite a large area. It's about 170 square kilometers, uh, and it's a combination of 
uh, several sort of rural or uh, one large rural area uh, that encompasses uh, a number of smaller urban areas. So the urban areas have uh, uh, fixed stops uh, kind of scattered in between them uh, that we made all available to one another through ODT. So anyone can board at one of those uh, stops, request a trip to another stop. And the rural area is accessible now through an address-based system as well. So uh, if you have a particular address that you want to travel to uh, using ODT uh, and it's out in one of the rural areas, then you can just input that into the app and say, I want to go there. And uh, ODT will take you there. So you've got the option basically wherever you are in this whole service area to uh, take the trip that you want to take. Um, so what we're looking at here, uh, again, it's the OD pairs for all of the trips that we saw over this period uh, that we're looking at. Uh, the thicker the arc between the uh, two stops, uh, the more people have requested it. Uh, and you can see that some of these arcs are definitely uh, thicker than others. Some of these trips are more popular than others, but none of them really overwhelmingly so, um, which is a good sign for ODT in general, because that's the sort of distribution of demand that we're really well equipped to handle. Uh, when we start actually getting into the uh, the numbers here, we see that the most popular single trip uh, was requested about 60 times, the most popular single OD pair, that is. Uh, but that's out of a total of almost 4,000 trip requests. So it's kind of a vanishingly small percentage of uh, trips uh, overall. And that's the single most popular uh, pair of origin and destination. So there's a whole lot of scatter throughout the service area. Um, which means that this particular metric alone is kind of hard to use to analyze the ridership and understand kind of in aggregate how people want to use the, the service, which uh, kind of leads into the question of how do we use this data then if, uh, if this particular aspect of it is uh, hard to get at. So when we're looking at those OD pairs, we've got uh, pairs of stops, pickups, and drop-offs. Um, and uh, one way to kind of make this uh, information a little bit easier to work with is by looking at the stops that were involved in those OD pairs and to see which stops were popular as pickup locations, which ones as drop-off locations. So this is the same map again. This is Fort Erie with the same data set. Uh, it's just that here we're looking at uh, the locations that were used for pickups and drop-offs within the service area. Uh, the bigger the dot on the map, uh, the more times it was requested as either a pickup or a drop-off. Um, so here, what we're starting to see is there are some patterns that make a little bit more sense. They're a little bit easier to interpret just visually. Uh, it's not a big kind of uh, spaghetti mess of arcs uh, scattered across the map anymore. We're starting to see a little bit of a trend of the locations that are really popular for riders to travel to and from. Um, like I said, uh, we, in Fort Erie, uh, a single OD pair um, doesn't make up a big uh, percentage of the overall trip, requ trip requests. Uh, but when we start to actually look at stops instead, we see that the individual locations can be involved uh, in uh, upwards of 10% of trips. So the most popular stops within a service area uh, can be uh, responsible or involved in a actually meaningful percentage of the overall uh, volume of trips. And uh, generally, when we look at things like the top 10 pickups or drop-offs within a service area, we see that um, those top 10 most popular ones uh, can often account for 30 to 50% of pickups or drop-offs. So with those kind of numbers, we, we're starting to see some really strong patterns in ridership. We know exactly where, uh, if not a majority of trips are uh, going to or from, uh, then at least kind of a, a plurality. And uh, on the other hand, we also see sometimes that there are uh, stops that are hardly ever used in a service area. It's pretty common in all of our deployments to see that there's uh, between 10 and 30% of stops uh, that are just never used for trip requests, either as a pickup or a drop off. And um, in a fixed route service, that's kind of a problem. I mean, if you've got a, a route that visits a stop every single day, you've got a bus that uh, goes by that stop multiple times a day uh, and no one ever uses it, that's kind of a bad place for a stop. It's kind of a, a waste of resources to be visiting it. But in ODT, we're only ever sending a vehicle to a stop if it's been requested by a rider. So in that case, uh, it's totally fine to have stops that are just not used. They can just kind of remain idle in the system until eventually someone does want to travel uh, to that particular stop. And when they do, it's there waiting for them. But until then, it's not doing any harm uh, sitting there not being used. Um, so this is kind of uh, the first half of what we look at when we're analyzing this data, uh, the where aspect of it. 
Um, but where is just the beginning? Uh, so knowing where people are traveling within a service area is great. Uh, it makes for pretty maps, which is always nice. But um, the other half of this uh, is, well, there's more than another half of this. Uh, part of it is the when, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, but uh, there's also uh, a bunch of different kind of aspects of this. Uh, so uh, I mentioned kind of the, uh, the sources uh, where trips are coming from, uh, how far ahead of time people are booking, uh, all that sort of thing. We see these patterns crop up as well. Um, but uh, the, the other kind of important aspect of uh, distribution of service is the when. It's kind of when people are traveling over the course of the service day and uh, over the course of the week and the month as well, uh, although those trends tend to be a little bit um, less useful for kind of day-to-day -day, uh, service recommendations. So knowing kind of this distribution of uh, where people uh, are requesting trips uh, is good, but it's actually less important when it comes to scheduling than the when, uh, in ODT at least. So uh, with ODT, if uh, there's a bunch of trips being requested from a shopping mall, for example, then the system knows that and it'll send vehicles to pick those riders up. But it can only do that if it has vehicles available to work with. So we need to know kind of when those trips are going to come into the system uh, so that we can schedule them appropriately. So uh, if we have a situation where we've got kind of a spike of demand, maybe in the early afternoon, like we've got here, then that tells us that that's a time of day when we should try and have as many vehicles on the road as possible to accommodate that demand as it comes in. Um, which isn't to say that uh, the where of uh, what kind of these trips and the distribution isn't important. We do want to know uh, where people want to travel, uh, but it's uh, just a little bit kind of a second of a secondary concern compared to the distribution over time. Um, it can be useful. For example, uh, in that shopping mall example, if we know that a lot of people are going to be boarding uh, transit there, then if we find that uh, our drivers have a bit of uh, downtime in between handling trips, we, what we can do is we can say, hey, head over to the shopping mall just in case someone wants to uh, book a trip and uh, get on board the vehicle there. Uh, it just makes things a little bit smoother. Um, people don't have to wait around for as long for a vehicle to actually travel over to them. Uh, and if we know that a location is a popular spot for uh, walk-on trips, then uh, having a, a vehicle, a bus, or a car uh, handy right there uh, makes it easier for those riders to uh, interact with transit as well. Uh, they don't need to book ahead. All they have to do is walk out of the shop and jump on board a bus. Um, yeah, so uh, these are kind of uh, the big things that we're looking at for distribution of uh, demand. And uh, as these patterns begin to crop up, what we're looking for are uh, basically the strongest patterns and uh, to see kind of if those are uh, patterns that are either good news or if they're bad news. And sometimes they are actually bad news. Um, so we're not just limited to kind of information about how the service is being used in terms of where people want to travel and when. We can also see stuff like uh, possible pain points for those trips. So we can take a look and see if trips are being picked up late, for example, uh, if riders are spending an excessively long time on board the vehicle after being picked up. Um, this is the sort of data that kind of just naturally comes out of ODT. We have access to all of this information. We know when someone wants to travel. We know when they got on board a vehicle. We know when they got off of the vehicle. It all just kind of uh, crops up in the data naturally, just as a part of doing business uh, with the system. So we have access to all of these performance metrics that are, in a fixed route context, very difficult to get a hold of. Uh, this is normally the sort of thing that you would need to do like a rider survey uh, for to kind of figure out uh, how many people are being picked up late or how many trips are taking more than 45 minutes to complete, that sort of thing. And uh, those surveys are, uh, they're costly to kind of distribute and collect and process. There's always going to be some bias in that data because, I mean, if you're asking people, uh, hey, how's your uh, experience with transit been? the people who have the worst experience are going to be the ones who are the most likely to respond. Uh, so there's kind of some inherent uh, bias in the types of resp responses that you're going to get there. Uh, whereas with us, we've got all of this data that just naturally comes out of the system uh, over the course of the day and over the course of handling those requests. And it's all just unbiased. It's all just data right there uh, in front of us that we can use uh, to investigate whatever we want to see. Um, and so what we do uh, is we look for those trends. We look for patterns uh, in kind of long ride times in lateness, and we see where those are cropping up. If it's a particular place in the system, if it's a particular time of day, 
we can use the information that we have access to to kind of uh, see if the system that we've got uh, working for us is really doing its job. <clears throat> And uh, if it isn't, then we can make interventions into the system. We can change up our scheduling practices, or uh, we can adjust our uh, parameters within the, within the system. We can make these kind of targeted interventions to improve service just on the fly. Um, maybe not on the fly. That might be a bad uh, choice of words, because we do want to try and gather as much information we, as we can uh, out of the ridership uh, over as long a period of uh, time as we can. The more data we have, the better our information is, and the smarter we can be about making those changes. Uh, but just within the ODT system, we can make uh, changes to our parameters uh, in order to try and do a targeted intervention and uh, address those pain points. Uh, but sometimes what will happen is that we'll see patterns of ridership that we can't really easily address uh, using just kind of changes to scheduling or changes to our uh, se uh, system parameters. And so, you know, that might lead us to have to do the uh, the unthinkable and have to think about reintroducing a fixed route into the service, which coming from us, coming from the on-demand people is kind of a weird thing to say. Uh, but there are, like, it's a fact of the matter that ODT, we obviously think it's pretty great. We have a company that kind of is all about that. But there's some patterns of demand that just can't really be well accommodated by ODT. Uh, ODT does really, really well in cases where you've got uh, generally low ridership demand. It's kind of scattered around a service area. There aren't strong patterns uh, of distribution over the course of the day. Um, whenever you have that sort of distributed demand, ODT is going to be your best option there. But if you've got very kind of consistent high volumes of ridership demand along a particular path, then that's the sort of situation that a dedicated fixed route is really well equipped to deal with. And there's just no way around that. Sometimes a fixed route is going to be the best tool for the job. And so now we've kind of come full circle. Uh, we've uh, circled back to the point where, uh, you know, we started in an area that was underserved by fixed routes. We introduced ODT and found that ODT can't necessarily keep up with it. So we're back on this fixed route idea, uh, which is like, oh, well, didn't we just start here? Haven't we been here before? And it's true that we have, but the fact is that uh, we have a lot more information than we did before. Um, using ODT as a tool to gather data about ridership lets us be a lot smarter about the decisions that we're making about where fixed routes should go. Usually, we're not launching into uh, service areas that have these really strong patterns of demand or that uh, are seeing a ton of usage on their fixed routes. That's why we get involved with these places to begin with. Uh, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't ridership demand in these uh, areas. It just means that it's kind of hidden. It's not well served by the fixed routes that are already there. And so by getting rid of those fixed routes, we use ODT to reveal those patterns and see exactly where that demand is. And then using that, we can be intelligent about placing fixed routes and build better fixed routes using that on-demand data. So this is it. This is how ODT helps build better fixed routes. Uh, we launch into an underserved area, we learn when and where uh, people want to use transit in that area, and then we can design fixed routes around that demand, uh, rather than kind of dictating to riders, these are the routes, these are what you have to work with. Let's look at a couple of examples uh, that uh, are uh, customers of ours that we've worked with to do exactly this. So Belleville, uh, our relationship with Belleville is pretty well established, um, pretty well documented as well. Uh, we were, started working with them several years ago now to replace their uh, nighttime uh, fixed route service, which originally looked like this, just one long route that ran all the way around the, uh, the city. Um, but we started off just by replacing this with an on-demand uh, deployment that uh, opened up all of the uh, stops within the city uh, to ODT. So riders were able to use ODT to get around wherever they wanted to go. Uh, but, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that sometimes things change. A little thing changed last year. Uh, when the pandemic first started out, uh, Belleville Transit made a pretty dramatic change. And uh, when they saw that their fixed route ridership was uh, basically in free fall, uh, as transit ridership is kind of everywhere, or was everywhere at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Belleville replaced all of their fixed routes uh, with ODT. So uh, they replaced uh, their full uh, service period night and day with uh, just a complete ODT deployment. And uh, as you can see, uh, the, uh, the pre-COVID nighttime ODT numbers don't really hold a candle to uh, this peak COVID ridership uh, that we saw through the uh, kind of middle of last year. Um, 
over time as uh, the situation kind of evolved, as we got more information about uh, COVID in general, about uh, kind of how to work with it, how to uh, keep uh, living our lives uh, with the pandemic going on in the background. Uh, the ridership of um, or, uh, Belleville Transit gradually started to reintroduce their fixed route uh, service. Uh, and this was motivated by a number of different factors. Um, but kind of midsummer, what they found was that uh, there was kind of a push from some of the industrial employers uh, in the eastern end of the city uh, to reopen and kind of spin their operations back up. And so uh, as we uh, read, as uh, the fixed routes were introduced during the daytime, we maintained ODT uh, in the nighttime service period. But we found that. Um, for one thing, the ODT numbers uh, at this point were higher than they had been pre-pandemic. And for another, ODT wasn't really uh, keeping up with this demand for a few different reasons. Um, I mentioned the employers uh, in the eastern end of the city. Uh, a lot of uh, the ridership in Belleville uh, at night were uh, the employees uh, of those uh, factories in that industrial area making use of ODT. Uh, so that's kind of a consistent pattern of demand, exactly the sort of thing that ODT doesn't really do well with. Um, there were also some restrictions on uh, vehicle capacities still in place uh, as a uh, pandemic measure. Uh, so there were a bunch of different factors that meant that ODT wasn't really keeping up with the demand that we were seeing. So um, Belleville Transit staff asked us to think about implementing, or they uh, let us know that they were thinking of implementing uh, fixed routes uh, to kind of cover the industrial area. Uh, and uh, they also knew that the Walmart uh, up in the northern end of the city was a big hotspot for ODT. Uh, and so they asked how to kind of cover uh, those two areas of interest using fixed routes. So uh, the good thing about having a big whack of data like we have from this peak COVID period is that we have a lot of information to work with. So we took a look at some of the patterns of uh, travel demand uh, during that time. Uh, specifically looking at trips to and from the industrial area, uh, which is over in the, uh, the right-hand uh, side of these maps, uh, and the pickups and the drop-offs uh, involving the Walmart uh, up in the northern end. So we looked at those uh, areas of interest and we figured out kind of if a rider starts off at either of these places, where do they go? Where do they actually exit the service? And uh, what we did, uh, we looked at that, we kind of figured out uh, when that was happening over the course of the day. And we figured out that uh, there were a couple of fixed routes that we could implement that would really serve these two areas of interest quite well. And the end result of that was this. Uh, it's a hybrid service area that combines an ODT deployment. Uh, all of those yellow stops or yellow points are uh, transit stops throughout uh, Belleville. Uh, so it combines that ODT deployment with these two fixed routes, the, uh, the blue and the green there, that cover these two areas of interest. So the industrial park areas uh, out to the eastern end are connected with a fixed route service that runs regularly. Uh, we found that a lot of the riders from those industrial areas ended up on the western side of the city uh, at those stops that are well served or that are covered now by that blue route. And the Walmart uh, up in the, uh, the northern end of the city there um, is covered by both uh, routes. They converge there. So we've got these kind of hotspots that are covered by fixed routes while maintaining the flexibility and the convenience of ODT elsewhere in the city. And uh, this is kind of the best of both worlds. We've got uh, both types of service doing what they're meant to do. And we have some tools inside the system as well that uh, make sure that these two kind of stay in their own lanes and they don't interfere with one another. Uh, another example of this was Sioux Falls. Uh, so we started working with uh, Sioux Falls, Sioux Area Metro or SAM uh, last year. And uh, the goal there was to replace their fixed route uh, Saturday service with ODT. And so we did that. We got rid of all the fixed routes on Saturdays and just allowed riders to use ODT to travel wherever they needed to go. And this was kind of a big deal for uh, Sioux Falls because one of the main complaints, one of the main reasons that they were interested in using ODT uh, was that riders were reporting that uh, they were having very long travel times from their uh, original uh, pickup point to their final destination. And that a lot of trips uh, were uh, needed to make use of two or three transfers uh, to get uh, to that final destination. So spending a long time on board the bus and having to transfer several times along the way, which uh, are both things that ODT does pretty well at addressing. So uh, we implemented ODT and we pretty quickly found that there were in fact these kind of patterns of uh, these popular stops that we usually see in our deployments. 
uh, some places in the service area were much more popular than others. Um, you can see them on the map here. Uh, in the middle of the service area is the bus depot in the downtown area. And uh, out in the east and the western ends, you've got two commercial areas that were also very popular for riders uh, to travel to and from. Uh, this was the case generally. And um, what we found actually was that uh, ODT was kind of too enticing of a prospect for the riders. Uh, we ended up having quite a lot of riders who were requesting trips. And uh, Sam's uh, staff in particular found that they were having difficulty keeping up with the volume of call-in requests that were coming from their riders. So people who, for whatever reason, were unable to make use of our, uh, our self-serve options, our uh, mobile apps or the web portal, um, they still had the option to call in and speak to dispatchers and have them uh, arrange trips on their behalf. Uh, and uh, they were making use of that option, which is great, uh, but to such a degree that Sam's staff were having trouble kind of keeping up with that demand. So what we did for them, uh, we did kind of a targeted investigation into uh, where those trip requests were coming from and going to. And we found out that actually a lot of the uh, volume of trips that were happening uh, to and from the bus depot and to and from these industrial or these uh, commercial areas on either end of the city uh, were actually coming from uh, dispatcher entered trips. So the people who uh, needed to call in and speak to a member of the staff were taking these trips uh, back and forth from the center of the city to the two ends there. So uh, looking at that, we looked at some of these stops that were in these uh, different areas. I've got them highlighted on the map here. And uh, those were the areas of interest. Those are the stops that we wanted to connect using a fixed route. And in this case, it's kind of a match made in heaven, right? Because um, people who were calling in and speaking to dispatchers to request trips are the people who don't necessarily have access to uh, the tools to monitor their uh, trip requests as they're being handled by the system. So they're the ones who really benefit from the consistency and the predictability of a fixed route. So putting uh, fixed routes into place to connect these uh, highlighted areas is really a no-brainer. And uh, what we found, uh, or what we went ahead and did, was that uh, we built these fixed routes uh, exactly to that spec. So uh, Sioux Falls on Saturdays uh, now operates an ODT service connecting all of these purple points, while anything on the green and orange lines there, those green and orange stops, uh, is serviced by a fixed route that connects the commercial areas uh, at the two ends of those routes with the bus depot in the center of it. And this is kind of another uh, success story where we've ended up with a hybrid service where we've got ODT uh, where it can do best and fixed routes where they do best as well. And uh, the overall result is a service that's uh, predictable where it needs to be and flexible where it doesn't. So uh, that kind of brings us just about to the end here. Uh, I just want to go through a couple of key takeaways for you know what we've been talking about, how ODT data can go into building better fixed routes. So just because a route is underperforming in a particular area or at a particular time of day, doesn't mean that there isn't consistent ridership demand in that area. All it means is that the route, for whatever reason, isn't well-placed to meet that demand. Uh, if we move into that area and we replace the route with ODT, uh, we can then listen to riders and have them tell us exactly where they want to go and when. And by listening to those riders, we can find patterns of demand uh, in that service area. Uh, and see exactly where it is that people want to go, uh, when they want to travel, where they want to be picked up and dropped off. And uh, depending on kind of the scope of those patterns, uh, we can either customize ODT service to meet those, to make sure that uh, within our platform, we're delivering the best possible service to riders. Or if we see patterns that we really can't accommodate strictly within ODT, if we need the consistency of a fixed route, then we can build one. Uh, we can build a route intelligently based exactly on the patterns of data that we've seen uh, so that the fixed route then is gonna do a better job of meeting the demand that existed in that area. Uh, so we use ODT to kind of uncover that hidden demand that wasn't uh, previously uh, obvious to us when we're looking at uh, patterns of uh, ridership there. And kind of the best part of all of this is that at the end of the day, we can do this uh, without interfering uh, between the two systems, between ODT and fixed routes. We can create a hybrid system that uh, is uh, both flexible and consistent and uh, predictable uh, all in one package so that riders, no matter where they are in a service area, have access to good transit that is well customized to their uh, needs and will get them where they need to go.
Thanks so much for listening. All right. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, now we'll open it up to uh, some questions. We do have a little bit of time left over uh, for audience questions. Uh, so again, if you if you do have any questions, you can just pop it into the chat or in the Q and A section. Oh, and it's okay. We've got the first one, so I'll just read this out. Um, so. In your experiences uh, with Belleville and, and Sioux Falls, uh, was there any was there a discussion slash plan devised for the longer term that addressed how often a complete uh, data analysis could be performed to revisit fixed root plans? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, so, have you seen any longer term uh, plans for approaching you know all this data that we're generating? Uh, what what are what are agencies doing to plan in the long term uh, to use this? Yeah, um, it is a good question. Uh, typically, what we do um, is uh, we'll wait and see kind of how well ODT does uh, to address any kind of problems uh, that uh, were there uh, for the initial deployment. And then uh, in terms of frequency for when we're doing these uh, data reviews, these analyses, uh, that really depends on uh, kind of a lot of different factors. Uh, some of our agencies are a lot more uh, interested in seeing the data uh, than others uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, so sometimes we'll do them kind of on the regular, uh, on a monthly basis even uh, for some customers, but sometimes it is more just kind of a, uh, a wait and see if uh, we're getting negative feedback from riders, for example. Uh, and at that point, we, we really get in there and crunch the numbers and see uh, what patterns might be causing that. Um, in terms of longer term planning, uh, it usually is kind of a, a wait and see sort of thing. Um, with uh, the fixed routes, uh, we are unfortunately kind of limited at that point in terms of uh, the access to the data that we have. Uh, anything within our system is obviously very easy to report on, very easy to do these uh, kind of analysis uh, work on. But when you do get a fixed route involved, you're kind of back into this place where uh, you don't necessarily know everything that's happening within the system. Um, so for kind of longer term planning, a lot of it is kind of uh, listening to riders at that point and doing surveys and doing kind of uh, uh, that survey work to understand uh, if uh, the feedback to the uh, the new fixed route is, is good or if it is still lacking in some way. Um, so it's kind of a, a case by case basis almost, uh, but it really does uh, just involve kind of uh, making use of the data that we have access to in the specific service area. Okay, and just to build on that question, I'm curious, uh, how long do you need to run an ODT service uh, in order to have enough data to start making these decisions? Uh, so yeah. I guess, on the one hand, how long do you keep going, uh, keep looking or, or how often do you keep looking, but how long does it take to do that first look? That one really depends. Um... And the main kind of factor is how many people are using the service uh, on a daily basis. Um, so, I mean, if you've got a, a transit agency that only sees like half a dozen trip requests on a given day, then it's going to take a while. A long time. It's going to take a while for uh, patterns to kind of come out of that data. Um, on the other hand, if you've got a service where you have 200 trip requests in a day, uh, there you're getting a pretty good volume of of trips to work with uh, pretty quickly. But uh, it'll usually we'll usually let it run for uh, a month or two at minimum because that lets us see kind of some of these longer term patterns too. Uh, so if things change over the course of the month, which we've seen, uh, it's pretty common to see fluctuations in ridership over the course of a week uh, with different distribution, uh, definitely on the weekend compared to weekdays, but even uh, across kind of Monday to Friday period. Um, we wanna try and uh, give it as many different uh, options or as many different opportunities for uh, trends to emerge, whether they're time-based or just uh, purely based on location. So uh, it's kind of a wishy-washy answer, but it does depend really. Um, generally, the longer the better. Of course. Uh, and okay, we have another question. Uh, uh, so did you analyze the proposed routes to see how they would perform compared with ODT, um, thus taking into account the appropriate vehicle size, the frequency of the service, the operating time, the walking time, like the buffer area around each stop? Uh, so were, were those fat so those are the kind of factors that you're always forced to consider when deploying a fixed route uh, solution. Uh, so so did you look into those um, as well? Yeah, um, that's a big part of kind of how we come up with the proposed routes. Uh, we look at 
uh, basically how many trips uh, within an ODT context would have been uh, doable uh, using the fixed rate itself. And uh, so um, that goes into kind of deciding where the route goes uh, to begin with. Um, and then uh, if we end up in a situation where uh, with Belleville, they, they came to us with a couple of different options, a couple of different ideas about where the routes should go. Uh, so there we were able to say, okay, so this would have involved this list of stops uh, and this list of stops. And so of the trips involving those uh, particular stops, X percentage of them would have been uh, handleable uh, using uh, or X percent of the, the trips that we've seen to date would have been handleable using those fixed routes. Um, when it comes to stuff like uh, looking for a buffer area around the stops involved, that's a little bit harder. Um, with ODT, obviously, it's like I said, uh, you can go anywhere from any stop. So you have uh, a little bit less kind of um, ability to uh, say like, uh, the, the stops kind of adjacent to the ones that you're thinking of covering with a fixed route. Um, you can't say quite as definitively uh, what the volume of trips that would have been uh, accountable uh, for there uh, would have been. But we do take that into consideration. And there have been some situations where uh, we've kind of gone back and looked at uh, a buffer of kind of a couple of city blocks around a fixed route or around a stop of interest to see uh, how many trips involved that and how many of them were kind of uh, similar in whatever different or along whatever different attributes um, to the uh, the trips that we're actually actively considering. Okay. Um, I guess uh, one, what you did mention during the talk um, for these, oh, oh, here's another question. Uh, so would they be able to cope with the future demands? And uh, I'm not sure if that's regarding the, uh, the fixed routes or the on-demand transit, but maybe you could talk to us about how how we, had, like basically the level that we expect a on-demand service to operate upon. And then if it exceeds that level, um, when we start to consider uh, a fixed route uh, solution. Yeah, um, so in terms of kind of handling uh, future demand, we only know what we know when we're building the uh, the route, but typically what we do see is that uh, patterns in on-demand uh, usage don't change super quickly. Um, once we do see a kind of a consistent pattern of demand over uh, the course of a month or two, uh, we don't expect that to shift dramatically. Um, so from that perspective, uh, if we've built a fixed route, kind of taking that into account, then we expect it to do a decent job at the very least of covering kind of how things are going to evolve over time. Um, in some cases, uh, if, for example, we're uh, opening up ODT into an area that didn't already have uh, transit demand, then we don't have direct uh, ODT data to work from, but we can make some inferences from stuff like population density. Uh, I've done a bit of work with um, Stats Canada data about kind of demographics and uh, rates of car ownership and uh, reported uh, transit usage uh, to get to work, uh, that sort of thing. So you can make a few kind of um, assumptions based on that about uh, how many people are likely to use transit in a, in a newly served area. But um, it's really hard to do that kind of uh, large scale forecasting. Uh, if we've learned one thing from this whole uh, pandemic situation, it's that uh, predictions are really hard to make, especially about the future. Um, so we do the best that we can with the data that we the data that we have, and uh, there isn't really kind of a, a critical threshold that we look to see uh, in ODT. At which point uh, we say, okay, we definitely need a fixed route here. Uh, it's kind of an ongoing process that again depends uh, based on the service area in question. Um, but I think that the main thing that we do look for is kind of those pain points that come out of the, uh, the ODT data. So if there's a lot of lateness uh, and it's always happening at a particular time of day and you look and you see that at that time of day, um, the Walmart stop is exceedingly busy, then that tells you that there's a lot of ridership at that time. It's probably gonna be relatively consistent uh, in the future. And uh, if you've kind of exercised all your options purely within ODT to address that, then that's a good place to kind of um, introduce a fixed route at that point. But a lot of it is kind of waiting to see what the data shows and then uh, responding to that as best we can. Okay. Uh, and I think we have time for one last question. So if anybody has any, uh, any burning question in their pocket, uh, 
feel free to, to ask now or forever hold your peace. Uh, also, if you do, again, this is going to be sent out to everybody. So if you want to see the slides or whatnot, uh, you can just um, check out the recording. It'll be sent automatically um, shortly afterwards. Uh, so looking like uh, no other questions. Uh, so I have a question. Um, so we've seen these two cases of a hybrid system. How do you uh, make those two systems play nice together? Uh, so when you have an ODT service and a fixed route service all under one system, what, what's that? What is the trick to uh, keeping those uh, playing nice? Uh, so we're not feeding off each other or whatnot. Yeah, so that's definitely an important thing that we have to uh, keep in mind when we're trying to make a hybrid system like this. Um, ODT and fixed routes, uh, they can play well together if we take kind of appropriate care uh, to make sure that they do. But left to their own devices, they can definitely interfere with uh, kind of their own uh, their own kind of uh, areas of specialty. Uh, so uh, what we do uh, within the system, we have a tool that we call grains. Um, what a grain does is it lets us designate uh, kind of mutually exclusive stops within an ODT system. So if I have a, a series of stops running down Main Street, for example, I can add all of those stops to a grain uh, within our uh, platform. And so what that does is it prevents uh, any ODT trips from being requested between two trips or between two stops uh, on Main Street. So if I'm a rider and I want to travel down Main Street, I try and request an ODT trip uh, through there. Uh, the system doesn't let me. It gives me an error message that says uh, use available regular service instead. Um, and the goal of this is to make sure that uh, you know whenever we uh, build a fixed route through a service area, uh, we put a grain along those stops as well. And so that means that uh, rather than kind of allowing uh, ODT riders to use ODT to uh, travel along that pathway, uh, they are instead kind of ushered onto the fixed route because the fixed route is going to do a better job of getting them there anyway. Um, so uh, by putting a grain along those main street stops, uh, we run a fixed route along those main street stops. Anyone who wants to travel along that route can use the fixed route instead. And anyone using ODT can travel anywhere else, including onto or off of main street. Uh, it's just that they can't go back and forth uh, between those uh, stops that are already in the grain. And so that means that uh, the trips that are kind of well served along that route uh, by the fixed route service are kept onto the fixed route service. Anyone who wants to go anywhere else, kind of uh, exhibiting that more distributed demand kind of spread out over the rest of the service area, um, they can still use ODT to get wherever they want. So that's kind of what I mean by the, the combination of flexibility and consistency at the same time there. All right. Uh so we're just out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for, for attending and uh, wishing our American uh, uh, friends listening as well a happy Thanksgiving. And, and again, the recording will be sent uh, shortly afterwards. So again, thank you, everybody. Uh, have a good rest of your day.